Being an ancient DNA scientist is kind of like being an explorer. The past, by its very nature, is different from anything that exists today and so is ripe for discovery. When I began my PhD at Oxford in late 1990s, no one knew what type of bird a dodo was. And every day when I walked to our ancient DNA lab, I passed by the dodo specimen at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, and I thought, I would really like to be able to extract DNA from that. And so I asked the curators there if I could take a piece of that dodo and extract DNA, and they said no, because I didn't. I hadn't yet proved myself, but after a few years of showing that I could extract DNA from other ancient birds, they did let me have a go and I was able to extract a tiny bit of DNA from the dodo's leg bone. And from that, I discovered that the dodo is a type of pigeon. Not like the pigeon that lives outside, but a very cool, obscure group of pigeons, which is pretty exciting that we could learn something like that just from a tiny little shard of bone. The goal of an ancient DNA scientist is to use the past as a kind of completed evolutionary experiment to learn things that we can apply to making decisions today about how to protect species and populations and entire ecosystems in the face of projected climate change. For a long time, we thought we couldn't get DNA in ancient stuff at all. And then we discovered we could get DNA from ancient bones. And then later, we discovered that we could get DNA directly from ancient sediments. And that meant that we could reconstruct entire ecosystems, not just the genome of one mammoth or one bison or one extinct horse, right? But the entire ecosystem that used to be there. And then we could trace that over time and actually watch ecosystems change and evolve and react to changes that were happening to the climate in in real time. This is a genuine power to reconstruct the dynamic evolutionary history of our planet. And it really can provide new insights into what might happen as we move toward the future. When a lot of people think about ancient DNA, the first thing they think about is de-extinction, bringing extinct species back to life. Once an organism dies, the DNA that's in every one of its cells starts to decay. It gets chopped up into smaller and smaller and smaller fragments until eventually they can't be recovered. This is because of things like freezing and thawing um, or uh, microbes like uh, uh, fungi and bacteria that get into these, these cells and break down the DNA, turning it into whatever comes next, the future organisms of the world. Once a species is gone, it isn't possible to bring back an identical copy in every way. De-extinction is not a solution to the extinction crisis. But what we can do is we can use these evolutionary innovations of the past to augment living species, to recreate the key phenotypes of extinct species that can help ecosystems in the present adapt and survive we've developed new tools that can actually recover those tiny little broken fragments and piece them together. This, of course, is not the only technology that we would need for de-extinction. Um, we need things like, how do we identify the gene sequences that actually map to the phenotypes, the way an organism looks and acts? What we would need to edit in an Asian elephant if we wanted to create a woolly mammoth from that Asian elephant cell. We also need to develop technologies to edit genomes at lots of different places at the same time, because we know that there are lots of differences and lots of changes that we will need to make. Colossal Biosciences has launched three different species de-extinction projects, the woolly mammoth, the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger, and the dodo. And with each of these, what we're doing is creating new versions of these species, resurrecting core phenotypes so that we can put them back into their natural habitats to help those habitats by restoring the missing ecological interactions that were present when these species were still alive. All of those technologies that we're developing along the path to de-extinction can be applied to species that are alive today, but perhaps in danger of becoming extinct. In Mauritius, for example, which is the native home of the dodo, we're working to help augment the pink pigeon population. This is an endangered bird, also endemic to Mauritius. And the same tools that we would need to edit the genome of a Nicobar pigeon to create a dodo, we can use to help increase the genetic diversity of pink pigeons. Habitats around the world are changing at a rate that outpaces evolution's ability to keep up. And when we try to make decisions about how to use the limited resources we have to protect and preserve ecosystems, we do our best. We make scientific guesses about what will have the most benefit. 
But if we look into the past, we see that now is not the first time that habitats have been changing really quickly. And so we can ask, what made ancient ecosystems more resistant or resilient in the face of rapid change? And as we learn about the power that we have to shuffle organisms, to cause local extinctions, to move species around, the more we can do to limit the impact of these same behaviors on ecosystems moving into the future. There are risks inherent in any technology that is yet to be fully developed, but the promise of the tools of de-extinction for biodiversity conservation is great. And we have to remember that doing nothing is also a decision that also comes with risk. We should give ourselves the space and the scope at least to understand the potential of these tools at our fingertips. We should be growing the toolbox that we have to help stop species from becoming extinct. And these tools of ancient DNA and de-extinction should be among those.